On today's Visual Studio Toolbox, Mika and Andrew are going to give us an overview of Rosalind analyzers, and then we'll see how to write one ourselves. Hi, welcome to Visual Studio Toolbox. I'm your host, Robert Green, and today we're going to talk about Rosalind analyzers. And to do that, I am joined by Mika Dumont and Andrew Hall. Hey, guys. Hey. hey. Mika, welcome back to the show. Always Thank awesome you. to have you on. Love being here. <laughs> and Andrew, this is your debut appearance on Visual Studio Toolbox. <laughs> it Fantastic. is, yes. All right. I wish I had a t-shirt or something to give you, but <laughs> oh, man. I, there are no t-shirts awesome. and we're not in the same room, so. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so Rosalind Analyzers, this is not a new thing. They've been in the product for quite some time. Um, and obviously continue to improve with each release. But what we thought we'd do today is provide kind of an overview of what they are and what they do. And then we're going to see how, uh, what it would take to write one. So that's pretty cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. All right. Mika, you want to go first? Yeah. Okay. Let's, let's get started. So I'm going to share my screen. So first, I just like to give an intro of Roslyn. Uh, so Roslyn is the code name for the C Sharp and the Visual Basic compiler, where we built an open source API surface so that any developer can write really smart code-focused tools and technologies. And some of these tools and technologies are also known as analyzers. And analyzers are basically a tool that will run analysis on your code as you type and will report diagnostics in the editor. Uh, these diagnostics will typically manifest in the editor as squiggles. So if you're in Visual Studio or VS Code and you see squiggles, those are uh, analyzers running in the background. Analyzers can also surface a light bulb or a screwdriver suggestion, also known as a code fix or refactoring. And so the best way to understand what an analyzer is, is to see an example of one. So if we switch over to Visual Studio over here, uh, you can see that this is an analyzer over here. So um, it has two parts. It has the squiggle, letting you know that there's a violation and that's part of the diagnostic. And it has the code fix that will go ahead and fix the violation. And if we take a closer look at my error list, you can see I have these analyzers running in the background reporting violations in my code. And uh, analyzers also surface different types of severities. There's an error severity, a warning severity, and a suggestion severity. There's also a fourth severity called hidden or silent, but that won't show up in your editor or your error list because it is hidden. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Yeah, because that begs um, the question, where does it show up? <laughs> I know. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll show you later where that shows up as well. And so using my error list, I can actually go ahead and navigate to all of these code violations. And so uh, the first analyzer that we're going to start with is this informative one over here. Notice how like the UI is a bit less invasive. So instead of having that squiggle, it has these like itty bitty little three dots over here. I don't know, Robert, if you can see those. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, this analyzer is teaching me where I can use new C-sharp language features. Uh, which is simplifying this new expression. So we already have the type on the left side. So having it on the right side is just duplicating information needlessly. So I can go ahead and just accept this code fix to simplify this. And the next analyzer I have, you can see that var is being squiggled. And you're probably wondering, why is var being squiggled? So Visual Studio is actually telling me to use an explicit type instead of var. And so um, this analyzer running in the background is actually giving me a code style suggestion. So if I go ahead and accept this fix, it'll make it into an explicit type. Um, and the last one, this one over here, this is from the SDK. So the .NET 6 SDK has a lot of analyzers included by default that a bunch of engineers on the .NET team wrote. So you automatically get guidance on best practices when writing C Sharp and Visual Basic code. And so this analyzer is letting me know that if you catch an exception and re-throw it, it will mangle the stack trace. And so the correct thing to do is to just throw it again instead of re-throwing it. So I'll go ahead and accept that. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we also made it easy for you to view and enable individual analyzers and configure the severity to which you want each analyzer enforced with editor config. And editor config is a single file that helps you maintain cons consistent code by defining coding conventions. It can live with your code in the root in its repository and use the same source control. That way, everyone on your team who clones from that repo will get the same coding conventions. Um, and we recently created this brand new UI for it. So you can see I have my analyzers for white space, code style, naming styles, and this analyzers tab is for all those awesome SDK code quality analyzers. Oh yeah, the and, new UI makes everything so much easier to find. Yeah, it does. And honestly, we got so much feedback from users being like, oh, I want to see all these analyzers because we only like shipped a few that you were able to see in the old editor config file. Mm -hmm. And so this just makes it more discoverable. We have the search option here. Um, you can also disable individual analyzers. You can set the severity for them as well. So it's pretty awesome. So definitely check that out. Um, you can also actually enable individual analyzers and set the severity also through the light bulb. So I just wanted to show that one off real quick. So here I can go ahead and set this to let's say a, a warning. This makes the violation a bit more obvious. So you can see there's a squiggle over here. We check my error list. Um, it now shows up as a warning. Um, so that means, and this will automatically update my editor config. So that means everyone who clones from that repo will now get a warning uh, whenever a uh, variable is declared but never used. <laughs> so pretty cool. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, analyzers can have hidden diagnostics. Um, so they won't show up in the editor or the error list. Um, but they're represented over here by the screwdriver icon. And you can see if I invoke the screwdriver, I have this list of different types of refactorings. For example, I have this extract base class one, which actually Andrew implemented. <laughs> so, yeah, <I> did. <laughs> so you can select different members here and move it to a new class. So it's pretty cool. Um, so that was pretty much what analyzers are in action. Uh, so just a quick recap of what you can do with analyzers. Uh, you can use analyzers to identify errors before they compile. So notice that I didn't have to run a build. Uh, it's actually going ahead and like reporting violations for me in the background. Uh, you can use analyzers to enforce code style rules. You can use analyzers uh, as a teaching tool to teach new language features and concepts. And you can also use them uh, to introduce best practices for your SDK. So as a library author, you might see that people keep running into the same problem over and over again. So you basically can prevent that from happening by writing an analyzer and having it squiggle and surfacing a code fix that says, hey, you can use this instead of this. And it's just an easy way to teach people best practices for how to use your library. Yeah, I've seen the ones from XUnit do that a lot. And it's really helpful to learn uh, testing patterns with XUnit and they ship with that now. It's great. So the recommendation not to use var, that one you would set by kind of by hand, right? Because that's not the yeah, default behavior. It's not the default, no. So show us good, how you would do that. Good thing. example. Yeah, so for that, you can just go into your editor config, or again, you can also go into the light bulb and uh, set that as well. So if you go under, I think it's like under code style, var, you can just like search for that. Um, actually, let me see. Let me see if I can find it. Maybe it's use explicit type or. I think you had it there. There's a whole block of var preferences. Let me see. Up here for var? Yeah, if you type var again. Let's see. There's a uh, oh, yeah. var preferences for okay. built in types. So prefer, yeah, prefer explicit type. And then oh, right okay. now, yeah, and you can make it into like a warning or an error. You can also do prefer var. So. Mm -hmm. God. And then that editor config automatically shows up. You used to have to create it, right? Yeah. So in the old, in the old days, <laughs> the good old <laughs> days. Uh, so you can actually, we recently added an option uh, where you can right click and add a new editor config from okay. here. Yep. Yeah. 
So that's easy. Or you can just do the add new item and search for editor config. And there should be two options. So there's a .NET option that I would use. And then mm -hmm. there's the default one. And the default one is just sort of like a blank editor config kind of. So uh, yeah, editor config is a standard file format. So it also does all stuff languages. like spacing and everything. So. Yeah. So if, so if you add a new .NET editor config, it will show up with all of those options yeah. set to the Visual Studio default? Yeah, it'll set to the okay. Visual Studio default, yeah. OK. But if you wanted to create one for use by a team, somebody would create it um, and then the next put, uh, put it up into source control. And then the next time somebody pulled everything down, they'd get the new editor config. And then they would be subject to the yeah. hopefully agreed upon rules or <laughs> the <laughs> maybe not agree agreed upon rules. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, it's like the editor config wars, you know, on exactly. the team. Oh, yeah. No, e even when you're just talking about use explicit type, I'm the person who prefers var. I'm like, don't do that, please. <laughs> don't do that. It hurts my soul. <laughs> and then when you uh, had, when you used class twice, the first example, um, yeah. you had it changed to, this is C sharp 10, this language, that ability it's actually, to get, right? I think it's C sharp nine. It's nine. a little bit older, I believe. Yeah. I'm not 100% sure, but I know it's an older C sharp language okay. feature. So if I was using eight and editor config said to do that, would it just, what would it do? What if I don't, so, oh, I'm not on nine or 10? Yeah, it wouldn't tell you to do that. You would have to be on like a newer SDK or a newer Lang version for that to show up. Okay, so would it not show up at all or would it have recommended that I don't type class twice, I, ju I could just use var instead? It wouldn't recommend it. Oh, sorry, do you mean var or do you mean, an ex or do you mean um, for you had the class one, new expressions? You had class one, class yeah. one, new class one. So you could have just replaced the first class one with var instead of typing the name twice, right? Oh, but yeah, so, yeah. In C Sharp 9, you can do this even cooler thing. Or Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it just simplifies it. So it just gets rid of it. And so, I just, I think to answer your question, it actually just wouldn't offer the suggestion for it. Okay. But Andrew, correct me if I'm wrong, would it still show up in the editor config? Do we Yeah, it would show up in the editor config um, because we just show all the supported options. And if you were to change your language version to nine, then we would start suggesting it. Yeah. Uh, and even if you have target type new, which is the new on the right hand side, um, if you put that in and you only have C sharp eight, for example, say you hand typed it instead of us recommending it, uh, we would tell you that you need to upgrade your language version and offer to do that. Okay, cool. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's actually awesome because it teaches you new language features, right? Like, yeah. when, you know, I thought, oh yeah, it's, it's going to recommend VAR, but then it recommended something that I potentially was under aware of. Yeah, it definitely helps people, one, understand the new language features and two, migrate them to, to them easily. Because if you had yeah. multiple instances of this that could be fixed, you can just click once and apply that everywhere. Um, I know a big change we did was in the Roslyn repo itself, we moved to you can see the namespace at the top. So that's mm -hmm. a file scope namespace, which is a newer C-sharp feature as well. Um, and we did a big change where we just changed all of our files to use that at once. And it was changing hundreds of files. How long did it take massive. to like apply that? that? <laughs> it, it's not very long because it's a very quick fix. Oh, nice. OK, yeah. All right, cool. So I think Andrew now is going to show up how to write an analyzer. Yes, let me pull right. up my Visual Studio. All right, so we talked a bit about like what analyzers can do, but if you don't find something you already want in our analyzers, you can write your own. And we also talked about like people who ship SDKs and tools and stuff can provide analyzers that help use the SDK correctly. So I have here um, just kind of a project that I've already set up where you can see I have an analyzers, code fixes, and then tests for them. Uh, we have a file new projects that you can get started that will help you set all of this up. I'm just going to go ahead and have it all set up and run through what I have done. Um, 
The basics that we'll start with is the analyzer. And the analyzer is what reports that diagnostic. And so that'll be like what you see as a squiggle or uh, something that shows up in the error list. We call those diagnostics. They have a diagnostic ID associated with them. Uh, and that ID is like, for this example, I just put my and then 0002. Uh, and I know from now on that that's my diagnostic ID that represents this error. And then I have a title that is block should use braces, uh, a message format that's to say like what the message looks like, a description to say like, oh, when possible, use curly braces on code blocks. And I added a category of code style. Uh, and the kind of building blocks of this is you inherit from this diagnostic analyzer class. It's a class that we provide with our tooling. You export it through MEF using a diagnostic analyzer uh, attribute. And then you'll have to override a few things. It will tell you to override this immutable supported diagnostics. Uh, and I'm actually going to move this to the new line because I zoomed in a little bit more. Uh, and you can see all I'm doing is providing this diagnostic description that is the supported diagnostics that my analyzer will use. So it's saying, I provide these rules. Uh, and that's just, again, something that's just the diagnostic ID, title, message, et cetera. All of this kind of concatenated together into a single type. Uh, and then the last bit is the you have to override this initialize. And the initialize lets you do register different kinds of actions. So if we look at this, you can register a lot of different ways. And the reason for this is really for performance. So you're, the kind of idea here is that you want to use the smallest common denominator you need for doing exactly what your analyzer needs. So in my case, this analyzer is going to be looking at uh, and I'll show some code just to show it off. Um, it's going to be looking at if blocks and say, if it's an if block and has curly braces, we don't need to report anything. But if it's an if block that doesn't, because it's not required by the language, we want to report something and say, no, we would really like this. Now, this is already functionality as provided in uh, our analyzers and in Visual Studio. So you wouldn't really write this one, but this is actually how we write it. This is a you can literally go into our open source and look at the exact analyzer that does that. I pared it down a little bit because it handles more cases than that. Um, so for this case, I want to register what's called a syntax node action. Now, syntax nodes are what the Roslyn API system takes the text that is C-sharp and makes a syntactical tree out of it. And so it's kind of a like tree representation of code. So you can see if I was to think about code a little bit, I can say, OK, this is a namespace block. And inside this namespace block, I have a class definition. And inside of that class definition, I have a few methods. And then inside those methods, I have a few statements. So it's kind of that breakdown of code. I'm not going to dive too deep into that, but that's the general idea. There's a lot of resources that you can use to learn Roslyn. Um, so what I wanted to do is a syntax node action, because syntax is just I want to parse code and see what it looks like. I don't need to understand anything about symbols or map any methods to any specific thing. So all I need to know is what the code looks like. So I'm going to use just syntax in this case. Uh, and what I'm doing here is I'm registering a syntax node action, and then I'm setting the syntax kinds that I care about. So I did three syntax kinds. They're pretty straightforward. This is only for C Sharp. Um, so it's going to be an if statement, for each statement, and a for statement. So I'm saying, my analyzer looks at each of those syntaxes, and whenever it occurred, whenever one gets called, this callback here, which is, has this context, is what we use to analyze whether or not we should report a diagnostic. Um, the actual logic here is pretty straightforward. We get the syntax node. We check to see if it's a for each statement, if it's an if statement or a for statement. We get the embedded statement, which is the like internal here. So if we're looking at the block here, this if. I'm going to remove this to make it a little bit more visible. Um, this is the if statement altogether. And the block is the curly braces here. So all we do is check, once we get that block, I want to check to see if it's a block syntax, because that's what these curly braces are. They're just a block syntax. So if it's not a block syntax, I report a diagnostic that says, I have the title. So we go back and look at blocks should be used braces, my diagnostic ID and everything. And that will be reported as a squiggle inside the code. So that's really all it is. And that's straightforward how you write an analyzer. Obviously, it can get very complicated depending on what you want to do. But the building blocks are there and really straightforward. But once you provide the squiggles on how to do an analyzer, you obviously want to, if you can, provide a code fix for people. So if we go back to the other side here, 
and I talked about this before in the Solution Explorer, we have a separate assembly for code fixes. All we're doing is providing a code fix provider that goes and does the same diagnostic ID. So remember I said my 0002. Uh, it looks at that ID and says, if I encounter that ID as an error warning or whatever, I offer that I can fix this for you. And so that's what really provides like the light bulb menu here. Since you will only see an error with an analyzer, but a code fix is like how you actually fix things. So, you know, use block body for property actually is an analyzer and code fix pairing. Um, and it's very similar to what is going on here. So we create this, okay, fixable diagnostic IDs. We inherit from a code fix provider based class instead of an analyzer. And it will just be an abstract class that tells us exactly what we need. Uh, we can provide a well-known batch fixer. So that means like when I use the light bulb, I can do a fix all on this. So you can see here, like use block body for methods. If I wanted to provide it in multiple places, that's what provides this document project and solution level. Uh, since these fixes are really straightforward, I don't have to do anything special. So we provide a uh, built-in type for that. And then we register our code fix. And all we're doing in this code fix is doing kind of the same thing we did in the analyzer. So we're getting the syntax that represents the document tree. We're getting where the diagnostic is reported. Um, and then we're finding the syntax node that is with the diagnostic. And then we're saying, OK, once we find that, we're going to add a code action that is going to say add curly braces. So like use explicit type instead of var. That's the same text that would be shown here. So if my analyzer was showing and running here, it would show add curly braces. Uh, and then I just provide a callback method for doing that. This is also pretty straightforward. Once in the callback method, I just get the syntax that was there before. I'm even using the same get embedded statement that I used in my analyzer. And then I'm just replacing that node with a block. So the Roslyn APIs provide syntax factories to generate code. Um, that's the general way you can do it. So you don't need to know exactly like write C sharp by hand. Instead, we just provide ways to say, OK, I want to generate a block statement, which is the curly braces. And I want what was inside of the statement before. So if it's the if statement, it would be that return in my test and wrap that in curly braces for me, replace that node, and return it. And it's that straight. Like, it's a lot of terminology to overcome, but uh, <laughs> this is exactly how we write <laughs> in Roslyn and in the SDK. Everything that ships, this is exactly what we use. It's the same technology, and it's all available to you. So uh, a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, is there good documentation on all this code? Add braces and get syntax, root async, and get embedded statements. Is that all well docked? There's uh, documentation. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> we always are working on improving it. Uh, it is on... Uh, the public documentation and in our okay. Roslyn repo. Um, and there's uh, even books written by people on our team who have yeah. done this. Okay. But it, I would say, hopefully everything is named to the way that as long as you're not doing anything too complex, it should be straightforward right. and you can follow examples. We do have a lot okay. of documentation with examples too. Um, and since we are open source, you can look at exactly how we do things. Okay. Um, so we're writing this code. You can look exactly how we wrote it. And then now that you've written the analyzer, what do you do? It's a DLL, how do you add it to your project? You can so, bundle it to a NuGet package. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> NuGet so you would ship a NuGet, <laughs> a NuGet package, package. then imports. Uh, so you can Got see this it. package ah, here. Okay. Um, and when I build that, it's going to generate a NuGet package for me that if somebody included, would include my analyzer. Okay, and you can, have it be a private NuGet package. You can publish it for the world to use if you, yeah. yep. if it's good enough and you're willing to support it. Yeah. So even if you have internal tooling that nobody outside of your company or whatever would ever use, you can still write analyzers and ship those just internally. Okay. Um, I, I don't think we have an example of this because we're open source. So yeah. there's probably examples in Microsoft that I'm not aware of. And then, do you? So you wrote an analyzer to do one thing. Does mm -hmm. an analyzer, if you want to do 10 different things, is that one analyzer that does 10 things or is it 10 different analyzers? Well, it really depends. So we usually recommend blocking things based on kind of if you can think of it as the same diagnostic ID. So 
technically this analyzer does three things. It looks at if statements, it looks at for each statements, and it looks at four statements. Okay. But it's all kind of under the same thing. Now you could write one analyzer that does a million things if you really wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. There's nothing stopping you from doing it. So that. if there's five things that I really want to have an anal have analyzers do, right? So every time I do a project, there's five things that Visual Studio doesn't recommend, but I want to be recommended. Mm -hmm. Would I write one analyzer to do all five or five different analyzers? I personally, just on that statement, would write five different analyzers, okay. but you okay. can ship them in the same NuGet package and the same DLLs and everything. Ah, there so it's just okay. the code cleanliness thing, but is, you yeah. can export multiple analyzers from the same DLL. Okay. Um, with so you could have multiple. Actually, this project here has two. One I had earlier, and one I wrote just for this. So this one also has an example of type should be uppercase, and it's just telling me that type should be uppercase. These are two okay. different analyzers of two, two different things, but they're all contained in the same package. Got it. All right. So there we go. Blocks should have bright, should have braces. And the other one, those are each individual analyzers that you're yep. shipping in a single package. Yeah. And that's why this one is my 0001, and the other one is okay. two. And those are all just two different kind of not even related things. But since I want them both in my package, I put them there. And diagnostic IDs just need to be unique to the analyzer, unique to the package. They don't need to be unique yeah. to the packages, right? Uh, they should be unique to the analyzer. Specifically, how we map code fixes is it has to do with the diagnostic ID. So we recommend being a unique diagnostic ID. Uh, okay. So like X unit, for example, has just the standard way that they do X unit zero one or something like that. Right. We have our code style ones. We have C sharp compiler ones that are like CSC number, all those. It's just a naming convention. Um, it doesn't have to be globally unique throughout the world, okay. but it does make things easier. Because if I wrote an analyzer and called it my zero 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 one, and then I used yours, which is my zero 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 one, for different things, is that going to cause a problem, or is that just going to be unfortunate? It's not going to cause a problem. You'll still get reported fine. Um, okay. And both should work. Awesome. It just might be confusing to a user who sees yeah. this. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, that is so cool. Yeah, I, I don't have. I guess the other thing to look at. And then um, the other, the other recommendation is to test the heck out of it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. We, Do you want to show that, Andrew, or like run the debugger? Or oh yeah. Um, so I can run the debugger, but I'm gonna go over. We ship test uh, packages as well to help you test. So you can provide a fix verifier. This one is test say my block should have braces, analyzer, and fixer with X unit. Um, so that's just the standard way we write that. And then I literally just have C sharp code that I'm saying this code is what I want to report my analyzer on. And this is what it's like when it's fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and this annotation here is just how we annotate a block where a diagnostic is going to be. So I know that my analyzer reports a certain diagnostic ID, and I expect that diagnostic to be reported here. And if it's not, the test will fail. Uh, and then if you run this test, we can go back to the analyzer here. So we can see that the node I'm looking at is an if statement here. Uh, and it is if true return. So it doesn't have block. When I get the embedded statement, it's just a return statement. So we're going to report an anal uh, diagnostic on that. Um, and then we can see, do, 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 we'll go into this fix here. It's running the analyzer again on the fixed code. And it runs through a few times just because of different variations of like how many times it's supposed to run in different configuration settings. Um, so we're going to see this hit a few times. But now we're seeing it go through the what is provided as the fixed code and running to analyze that to make sure the number of diagnostics I expect, expect is correct. Mm -hmm. And then this is where it goes through and says, I take the initial code, and I'm going to run the fixer on it. It's going to run all the fixers that are provided for that diagnostic ID. And we can just step through each single one. We can see if we get the updated block here, we're now adding block statement here where it wasn't before. And then that's it. So you can always debug through this. I highly recommend using unit tests to do this. It's the easiest way to test things. Um, and it, we provide a very straightforward, you just write C sharp here and you test it. Very nice. So let's say 
um, I have an idea for something that I want to write as an analyzer. Mm-hmm. How? What's the most reliable way for me to discover if that's already something Visual Studio is doing for me? So we have we have docs on all of our analyzers, and okay. we also. You can always just generate an editor config and just view all the different types of analyzers that we have okay. there. Um, and also, I wanted to mention that if you do want to get started writing an analyzer, you could just visit our repo and create an issue or just go on Discord. You know, we have in our README like how you can get started. Uh, mm-hmm. So, you know, we do have people from the Roslyn team that would be like more than happy to help you get started as well. And they can also just answer your question quickly. If you're like, right. if you go on Discord, there's like a special channel for Roslyn folks and be like, hey, I want to write this analyzer. Does this exist? And okay. you, know, you can get an answer really quickly versus right. searching for it through our docs <laughs> and editor config. <laughs> yeah. Or do you have a very active community and you can use, like Mika said, discussions, uh, our repos, github.com slash .net slash Roslyn. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has a link to the Discord as well. Right. Yeah. Okay, so here's a crazy question. Let's say you write an analyzer to address something that is either already in Visual Studio or shows up in the next preview, but you have a different answer than mine. Will they just show up next to each other? Yeah, so there's nothing stopping multiple analyzers from reporting in the same space. Okay. For example, so if like I had two analyzers that didn't like this name, they would both show up here, and they would just both show as code fixes here. Would would the one that's built into Visual Studio be highlighted? Would it say the good way to do it and that junk that you just wrote? <laughs> uh, I actually don't know the ordering answer on that one. I wish yeah. I did. Ordering is always confusing for me. There's this really special ordering that we do. Um, so. I don't know, like there is some sort of hierarchy with our ordering. Andrew, do you have more details on that? I feel like it's... I know within our repo, we explicitly try to order things that are, we consider like most convenient to least convenient thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but we explicitly do that. Now, I don't know what happens if a third party analyzer does the same thing we're doing, what yeah. the order is gonna look like. Okay. I would like to think ours comes first, but you know, honestly, I don't know. It'd be an interesting thing to check. <laughs> I know in Telecode um, added some refactorings or, you know, code fixes in the past, and it's kind of showed up in our light bulb for a while. And there's always sort of showed up first, similar to how it like showed up in the completion list. So those like start suggestions would always kind of show on top. But I think we actually made sure that it does. I don't know if that's how it would work for third party analyzers. Okay. Interesting. That's a very unique scenario. I never thought of anybody trying to do like analyzer spoofing. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm the first person that ever thought about it. So, just don't install random packages. There you go. <laughs> okay, or just don't write random packages. Yeah, or, or, no, you yeah, should yeah, always write stuff. random packages. <laughs> <laughs> you should write analyzers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. So, thanks. Thanks for showing this stuff. This is really awesome. Um, yeah, that no, was a lot of fun being here. We yeah, will so put much. in the show notes um, link to resources, which you guys will send to me. So we'll For be sure. able to point people to stuff. And this is cool. Stuff's built in and then looked pretty straightforward to write your own. So that's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, definitely reach out if you are writing any. We love to hear about it. All right. Yeah, thanks please so much do. For, thanks so much for coming on the show, guys. And we will see you next time on Visual Studio Toolbox.